Hello, I'm Professor Toybox, and I'm back with another viewer request, several in fact. I'm getting similar requests from multiple people, and while the requests may involve different creativa toys or different situations, they all come down to the same basic question that Froggy0602 asked me on Reddit. How do you tell a story? Since the text creator is no longer functional due to the Disney Infinity server shutdown, what else can we use besides text to tell a story? How do we lead the player through an adventure game in the toy box in a logical and meaningful way without text? It's a big topic, so we're going to spend a few days looking at it. Today will be an overview of my thoughts on this, and then I'll provide examples in some follow-up videos that will address the more specific requests that people have had. But first, you've probably been looking at my new toy box while I've been talking, and hopefully you're as eager to see it as I am to show it to you. So I'm going to give you a quick tour before we get started. I haven't done too much with the Marvel settings as yet, except for the Avengers Endgame video I did a few weeks back. So I decided for this toy box and this little mini-series on storytelling to use a Marvel setting, and I chose Asgard, because I haven't seen too many people use this setting in different videos, and I thought it'd be kind of a fun setting to use. Um, I built this offline to try to keep the video focused on the topic of storytelling, but as you can see, it's not working. <laughs> I just am so excited about how this turned out, and it's such a beautiful toy box that I had to show it off. Um, I'm just really pleased with how this turned out. So, um, let me give you a bird's eye view of this and just kind of show you what we've got. So this will be a little starting area down here and then I've got originally just one path going up to the palace up there and I ended up, I was having so much fun I built three different paths to get up there, one over here and one over here and um, initially it seemed like there weren't very many options for building pieces here and uh, there actually are um, more than I thought there would be, but they're scattered all around the toy box drawers. So I'll give you just a quick little look at this. Uh, of course, we have the basic terrain textures. There's uh, also the customizable objects in the plants drawer, which are where these are from. And then also further down in the plants drawer, you'll find these railings that have flowers on them. And you'll find straight, a straight one and an angled one here, as well as a couple of other flowery pieces. Let me see if I can find them real quick. Uh, <laughs> now that I'm looking, I'm not going to see them. Oh, here's one. It's a little flower pot here. And then there's also these. So that was in the plants drawer. And then in decorations, we've got these little urns here. And a slightly larger one that's animated, which you see here. Under set pieces is where you'll find these. These are from the Marvel Battleground set. There's this side and this side, and then a curved wall and a little straight piece. So those are there. This is another piece from the customizable plants drawer. Um, and then these railings here, which I'm using everywhere. Oops, I did not mean to do that. <laughs> I meant to pick that up. There you go. So those are in building group 7. That's where you'll find those, along with this trim piece, which I've used on several of the buildings, as you can see here. And so that makes a nice little trim piece there. And this fountain here is part of the... Uh, customizable plants. And then I did my best to recreate a couple of scenes from the Thor movies. First up is the palace. So we come in here 
and we've got the uh, interior of the palace and there's some funky flickering that happens there sometimes when you cover an area up with a ceiling. I'm not quite sure what the deal is with that. Uh, down here you'll find the stables and over there's like another nice little uh, uh, garden type area. And then up here would be Thor's or uh, Odin's throne room. And I looked around in the toy box drawers for the interior pieces and I couldn't find anything I was really happy with so I haven't put anything there yet. But off to the side is this little doorway here. And if we take these stairs down, we'll come to Odin's treasure vault. And inside here are these little canisters with different uh, treasures from Odin's vault. There's the Stormbreaker hammer and the Dark Elf outfit and the cask from the first Thor movie. And, uh, oh, the other thing that I found, too, is in the blocks drawer, there's two textures for the blocks that are Asgardian. There's that wall texture that I'm using there. And then there's also this other texture that I'm using for the stairs that has some Asgardian symbols on that. So I'm really pleased with how this turned out. The treasure vault just looks really good. That piece down on the end is from the uh, Assault on Asgard um, toy box game from Disney Infinity 2.0. That's where the enemies come out of. In the movies, that's where the destroyer comes out to protect the things in the vault. So I've got a lot of neat little areas here, and this toy box turned out much bigger than I had envisioned originally. But it's really beautiful, and I'm really pleased with how this turned out. So I'm kind of excited to build a few adventures in here as we talk about storytelling. And so uh, as we get started here, and here's the little garden area that was over here. Oh, and I wanted to show you this is kind of a little hangar defense area, the military section. So there's a couple of ships down there you can fly, and uh, some hangars. And those ships are from the Guardians of the Galaxy, set from 2.0. So, yeah, so I'm really pleased with how this came out. And like I said, I'm eager to run around in here and make some adventures. We're going to kind of do that next time. But for today, we're going to talk about storytelling. And so I want to go over that. But before we discuss the specific creativity toys that we can use to tell a story, I thought it would be helpful to first take a step back and talk about the general principles of visual storytelling. That's telling a story without words, which is what we have to do now in Disney Infinity. So it's all about showing and not telling, right? We've all seen dramatic films, cartoons, comic strips, or stage plays uh, that have few, if any, words. I think about Charlie Chaplin. Uh, I think about the Bugs Bunny cartoons where he's directing an orchestra and he never says a word. And you can watch those programs for a few minutes and you understand everything that's going on. And you wonder, you know, how are they doing that? Well, there are several principles in visual storytelling that we can apply to our toy boxes. The first would be context. This would be the context and uh, setting of the story. So the setting of your toy box can communicate a lot of information. The sky box, the textures, the objects, the decorations, uh, enemies and vehicles that you choose to use, all of these things establish the setting, which tells the player a lot about what they can expect. For example, you don't have to tell them it's nighttime in the city. If they see a sky box with an evening sky and high rises all around, they'll get that information without you using any text to tell them. Your goal in building the setting for your game is to be smart and selective about the kinds of things you put in your toy box so you don't confuse the user with a lot of needless details. Um, we've all seen toy boxes that have a little jumble of everything thrown into them. Uh, don't do that. <laughs> Likewise, uh, when players sit down to play your toy box, think about uh, the kinds of Disney Infinity figures you want to recommend them playing. Um, give them some choices, but don't let them pick just anything. Um, 
give them options that fit the context of your game. So running around in here as Thor or Loki or maybe one of the other Marvel figures makes a lot of sense. Running around in here as, as Mickey Mouse uh, wouldn't. Um, of course, there's nothing to prevent you from doing that, but if you're trying to tell a story, um, keeping the context consistent is uh, helpful. The same with any puzzles, obstacles, or challenges that you use. They should also fit the setting. A uh, player in a fairy tale setting isn't likely to be hacking into a computer terminal, so uh, you don't want to be um, confusing them with things that don't fit. Of course, there's nothing wrong with mixing genres, um, but if you're going to do that, you want to establish the fact that science and technology both exist in your game at the same time. So as an example, let's look at my toy box here. Uh, so what do you see? You see Thor standing in Asgard, and that tells you a lot right away for the setting from this game. We're dealing with superheroes who typically fight bad guys. You know Thor, and you know what he's capable of. <clears throat> he can fight. He can throw his hammer, <clears throat> he can summon lightning, um, there's all different kinds of things that he can do, and um, so you know what to expect there as a player. Uh, you also know he's home, Asgard is the home of Thor <clears throat> and Loki, so if he's fighting enemies here, <clears throat> then you know they're invading his home. They might be trying to conquer it, or they might steal something out of his treasure vault, the number and kinds of enemies that I use uh, will help convey that information. If I put down a lot of enemies, you can assume it's an invasion. If I put down um, some bodies everywhere in kind of a trail and you're following that trail and you only see one or two enemies at a time very infrequently as you're following that trail of bodies, you can kind of assume that it's a small skilled force that's uh, going after a specific target. Um, now, what if I want the enemy to be like the evil empire from Star Wars? There's certainly nothing wrong with doing that, and um, perhaps we might want to do that for our story. So let's assume that the empire is attacking Asgard. So to help establish that setting, I'm going to go ahead and put down a Star Destroyer over here, up in the sky. And we'll put this over where it's visible to the starting point here. So let's drop this right here, and then let's run back down here to the start of this toy box and see what that looks like. <laughs> it's a long toy box, much bigger than I was expecting when I started building this. Okay. So here we are on the starting point, and we're starting up the toy box. And I probably would want to move that Star Destroyer to the right because Thor's picture is picking it up. But as you come in here, you're going to see Asgard and you see a Star Destroyer hovering in the distance. So that tells me right away, without me saying a word, that in this toy box, in this story, the world of Star Wars and the world of Thor coexist in the same little universe here that I'm making. So that communicates a lot of information. As I play through this toy box, <clears throat> as a player, I can expect to see things from Asgard. I can expect to see Imperial Stormtroopers and perhaps Darth Vader and Jedi Knights playing as Luke Skywalker in here would fit the context and wouldn't be too far out of place because you could assume you're here to help Thor defend the the, um, this planet from the Empire. So um, that's a lot of information uh, that you can provide simply by throwing the Star Destroyer up there, and it's information that's immedi immediately available to the player without you having to say a word. Now another uh, facet of visual storytelling is color, and we've all heard how psychologists have talked about your use of color can build context and communicate without words. Different colors convey different messages and stir up different feelings. So if you want to convey a scene that should be sad, you'd be leaning toward blue textures and objects when you're building your scene. In the case of Asgard, uh, golden tones here convey happiness, confidence, and optimism. 
So facing any kind of conflict here would be highly disruptive to the mindset of the Asgardians, who think they're safe and untouchable. And we saw that with the Dark Elf invasion of Thor II. As the Dark Elves invaded, you saw the guards in Asgard were very nervous. Um, it's something they weren't expecting to ever have to face in their homeland. So you can use that um, uh, idea of color to help establish mood. Um, focus is another thing that's big in visual storytelling. You don't want to get lost in details. We all know the guy at the party who seems to ramble on forever when he's telling a story. Maybe he gets stuck trying to remember a specific detail, and it turns out that little detail he's stuck on doesn't have anything to do with the story he's trying to tell. Or maybe he feels the need to include every tiny detail of everything he remembers, which just bores the heck out of everybody who's listening. So uh, in visual storytelling, it's the same way, if not worse. You don't want to build a lot of tangential areas or give the player too many choices that don't lead anywhere. Um, you want to build your toy box in such a way that it tells the player where to focus and where they need to go. So if you look at my large toy box here, I've given, it's a very large area, and I've given the player right at the start a choice of three different directions to go. They can run straight ahead through this plaza or they can take the bridge to the left or right. But you'll notice no matter which direction they pick to go, all of them lead to the palace. There are no uh, side paths that lead into uh, dead ends. Um, there's no extra bridges that connect anywhere. Um, no matter which path they choose to take, they're going to get to the palace. And so that's kind of important. Um, when you're running through here, it looks like you have choices as a player. It looks like, oh, I can choose to run that way or I can run that way, but I've crafted this in such a way that although you have the illusion of choice, you're really only ever going to get to the palace, unless, of course, you turn around and go back the other way. Um, the last thing I want to talk about with visual storytelling is you want to keep the player moving. Stories have a flow. Um, we all know games that force the user to grind through side quests before they can advance the story, so don't do that. Um, likewise, be careful about the challenges you put in the player's way. Obviously, you have to put some obstacles and challenges in their path um, in order to make it interesting, but if the puzzle's too long or too insanely difficult, it's going to break the flow of your story and players will lose interest. So those are the basic um, general principles of visual storytelling that apply to us in our situation. Now let's look at some of the tools that we have available to us in Disney Infinity to help us tell a story visually. And uh, first, before we even get to that, I need to point out the fact that we do have some uh, text tools that are available to us. Um, our choices are limited, but we do have some text we can use. And probably the biggest choice of text that we have is available when you save your toy box. So when you come in here to the Save menu, one of the things that you have available to you is this description field, as well as the name of the toy box. And so you can use these to your advantage. Um, the description is only 500 characters in length, so um, you have to be kind of brief. That's only a small paragraph. But you can use that to supplement the visual information in the game. Use that to convey backstory or plot or the main goal. But remember, of course, you only have 500 characters, so don't waste them. Um, use it wisely. The save game title can be helpful, so you could perhaps use that to tell the name of the location that you're at, and then you don't have to repeat that down in the description. Um, also, you'll notice the game takes a screenshot that tells you uh, where you are. So, if, like for this one, this is the, the save game for this toy box, and I've got the location, Asgard, right in the title. So I don't really need to include that in the save game. Um, and I saved this, of course, before I threw down that Star Destroyer. So that would show up then in the corner for this toy box as well. Uh, so this screenshot tells me I'm in Asgard. I'm, I've got Thor, who helps reinforce that. And I'd have a Star Destroyer in the distance. So that screenshot tells me a lot. So I don't have to repeat all of those details in the... Uh, description. 
And so I can focus the description on the things that I want to do. And there's going to be a number of mini adventures that I'm going to create in here. So for my description, I chose to kind of emphasize what those are, what kinds of things you'll be doing in this toy box. You're going to be defending Thor's home, protecting the citizens who are going to be some mission givers, to asking for help. And you want to prevent the Empire from getting to the treasure vault and stealing the artifacts that reside there. So that's uh, my description. It's brief. I made the best use that I could of that to communicate to the player before they start this what they can expect coming in story-wise. And, and between that and the title and the screenshot, that all communicates a lot of information. That's the biggest piece of text that we have available to us. Uh, the other being, of course, the text displayer. And this is a set of predefined phrases that are available. And um, I've already run through here and built a list for myself of all the different sayings that are in here. Um, and I can't really show them with the properties. You kind of have to invoke those with another tool, like the like a button. So if we throw down a button or some other trigger for this thing, this is how you can kind of review what's available for these uh, short text phrases. So we come over here. Um, we've got some different categories of things. And under each category, there's a number of um, possibilities. So there's different things in here that you can use. As I said, I've already built a list of all of these and gone through this drawer. And I'll include that on my blog uh, at the end of this video so that you can uh, go over there and print that list out and look at it yourself. And that would be helpful. Um, so between the save game and the text displayer, those are the text pieces that you've got. It's not much. And again, the text displayer, there's always going to be situations you run into where you wish you had a certain phrase and it's not available. So for that, um, we have to rely on visual storytelling. So to do that, we have a number of toys at our disposal that we can look at. Of course, we've already looked at the textures for the terrain and the skybox, uh, the skybox changer. We've seen those in other videos. Some of the other things that we have available to us are the boom box. Um, we all know that the choice of music in your game can uh, really affect the mood and setting of your toy box. You don't have to settle for the default music that comes with a particular sky dome. You can change it to best fit your game. You can also change the music dynamically as the mood or situation in your game evolves. Another one would be the sound effect generator. So adding ambient sounds to your game can really help establish the setting as well. Um, things like uh, peaceful birds chirping or maybe distant battle sounds in this toy box, that would be helpful and meaningful to tell the player what to expect. Uh, if you're building a scary toy box, um, Horror screams would be good. That helps establish the mood and reinforce uh, for players what they can expect from that toy box. These are basic expectations that players have, and the sounds will reinforce that. Um, from a visual standpoint, we have the effects generator over here in the Creativa Toys. And you can use this to add smoke or fog or random lightning or fire. So if you want to build a certain mood or setting um, where it's a storm or it's a catastrophe or whatever, this will help you a lot and communicate a ton of visual information to the player. Now, what about the characters, the people who live in your game world? Um, how can they help you tell a story? Well, the biggest thing I can think of with that would be the action enforcer. And you can use this to make a player character uh, show emotion or react to something in such a way as to show how they feel about it. Um, I think back to the Ninja Warrior course that I did, my very first video. So when Mickey fell off the course into the water, I used the action enforcer to show his frustration and disappointment. So Mickey clenched his fists and stomped his foot. You could tell he was mad at himself. He didn't have to tell you that, and I didn't have to say it. Um, it just communicated that visually. You can also set reactions on townspeople. You can use that to show that the townspeople are excited or happy about something you did, or they're afraid of the empire, 
Um, maybe they're running, maybe they're hiding, maybe they're sad, uh, they're excited about something. So you can use that to help communicate information without using any text. Um, some other items here for um, some of the inhabitants of your game world would be the marching orders and the enemy trail guide. Uh, these you can use to make townspeople or enemies uh, move to a specific location or in a specific direction or path. So adding um, some paths and attaching stormtroopers to them. Um, maybe they're mar you can make them march through town like they own the place, or you can make them run to uh, defend or attack a bridge or a key location. And so um, having enemy troop movements and uh, townspeople moving in certain directions away from or towards something can help convey the story as well. And another thing that's available um, are things like this safety dome that you can put an object inside. Uh, those uh, Odin's treasure uh, tubes down in the treasure vault. Um, there's a number of toys that enemies will attack when you put them in the toy box. And so whatever you put inside these items tells you what the enemy is after and what their goal is. Um, it also alters their behavior. They attack it. And that helps you tell your story in a visual way too. So you're affecting the movement of the enemies and using that to tell your story. What they're after, where they're going, what their goal is. So that's things you can do with the characters in your game to convey story. Um, what about guiding and directing the player through the story? Well, probably the biggest thing I can think of for that would be uh, over here in the Creativitoys drawer, and that would be the radar marker. You see this used a lot in the play sets, so anybody who's played Disney Infinity is likely already familiar with this. Uh, you can use that to direct players to specific locations. You can use it to tell the player what they need to do. So if you have an arrow pointing at a button, um, players are going to know they got to run up and push the button. If you have it just sitting out here in the middle of nowhere and pointing to that, the players will assume they just need to go to that location. And when they get there, you'll tell them where to go next or what to do next. So you can use this to make mission givers. Um, and uh, you can also make mission givers and enemies and collectibles show up on the radar as well, which is helpful. So that's the biggest way we have available to guide and direct people through a story. Uh, another option, not so subtle option, down in the decorations drawer, we've got these arrows. So it's, like I said, not very subtle, but you can tell them, hey, go that way, or no, turn around. <laughs> so... Um, you can use those to point the player along the path that you want them to take. Another subtle choice um, to direct them, which might be better, would be up here in the Creativa Toys drawer. We have these area lights. And so when you put this above an area, it kind of lights it up a little bit. And if you're using a sky dome with a darker evening setting, players will be more likely to notice and follow the path that you light up uh, versus a darker path. Another option for directing players through here would be to use the cameras. So you can use these to build like a little cutscene that shows the players where to go or what to do or something happening somewhere that they need to address. Um, the camera can be standing still, or I believe you can connect these to a path as well and make it a little bit more dynamic. <clears throat> We're going to explore all of these different ideas here in a coming video. But these are some of the toys that can help you with uh, visual storytelling. And I think that's probably enough today. This is a good overview. So next time, I'm going to work on addressing some of the specific requests that players have had um, for doing some of these exact things and connecting these uh, toys that we're talking about and actually making a short little adventure and I'm going to do a couple of these because there's a couple of different things that I have in mind for this toy box that will show you how to use those creative toys. So I think that'll be pretty exciting and I'm really really excited to see uh, how this turns out and to be able to use um, 
the Marvel setting here along with Star Wars to build something kind of unique and fun. And uh, hopefully that'll be a, um, some great examples and give you some ideas of how you can tell a story in your own toy boxes. So for now, I think that's it for today. Go ahead and uh, sign up on my blog or subscribe to my channel to see what we do next time. You can find build tips and logic diagrams on my blog for the different challenges that I make. And um, <clears throat> for now, this is me and Thor signing off from Asgard, and we'll see you next time.